Bright Pack Radio, a podcast produced by Winding Trails Media for writers by writers. Writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host and producer, David Allen Lucas, author of Crazy Things and working on audio dramas. Also, if you didn't catch the previous episode, I'm currently married to one of my co-hosts here, Melanie. I'm not a host. Here, well, you're a co- you're, you're, you're co-host co-host now. You're, you're the first lady. lady. <laughs> <laughs> the first yes. lady of Bright Pack. <laughs> to Melanie. So, but before we get to her, let me go introducing my lovely co-host. The actual co-host. The actual co-host, the one who keeps me on my toes for the show. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kathleen Kayembe. I write paranormal romance under the pen name Kaseka and Vita. I have stories forthcoming from Nightmare Magazine and Lightspeed Magazine, and yeah. I teach, um, well, lead writing workshops uh, with the AWA Amherst Writers and Artists Method here in St. Louis. Excellent. Thank you. Hello. Oh, I forgot to mention while I'm at it, November 26th down at the Central Library of St. Louis, the St. Louis City Branch, um, I will be presenting Story structure at I believe two o'clock. Ooh. That's part of our Nano Rimo writing time. So, along with us also is uh, Brad R. Cook, the author of steampunk stuff and many many other things. Uh, but the Iron Chronicles, which is Iron Horseman, Iron Zulu, and the soon to be released Iron Lotus. So yeah. check it out. Yeah. I'm excited. Join me on November twenty sixth at Main Street Books for Small Business Saturday, the start of Christmas traditions. Where I will be unveiling Iron Lotus to the world and all the steampunky things. The third and final part. I know. This is it. It's fun. So you go down to the library. No, you first you go to Brad first. Then you go down to the library. Then you come to come see me. Okay. All right. Yes. Take a pause because Kathleen was to open her soda. Yes, I, I got it out. Ha! And okay. And with us also <laughs> is sorry, screaming gremlins. Okay. Um. Melanie Lucas, who has had no time for writing, and uh, maybe I'll get back to it in a, you know, month or two. <laughs> Melanie, what, may I ask, has taken up all of your writing time? <laughs> <laughs> well, she was promoted. <laughs> promoted? Do tell. What could possibly have happened in the past few weeks that would take up all of your writing time? <laughs> I think, I think Dave just said I got married. Oh, oh I'm so yeah. sorry, yeah. Mrs. Lucas. <laughs> You guys are having too much fun with us. I love it. Oh yes, you guys should stop being adorable then. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so like okay, and then instantly stop being. Adorable. Well, they could not stop being adorable. Come oh, on. I know. Especially considering how much they smile when we tease them yeah. about it. Yes. <laughs> and also with us today is <laughs> Fedora Amos. I write Victorian whodunits like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis, and my new book out from Five Star, which is Mayhem at Buffalo Bill's Wild West. I am also the Vice President of Greater St. Louis and Sisters in Crime. And you can visit me on the 17th of November at the Spencer Branch of the St. Charles Public Libraries for their local author expo. And I will not be alone. Who else is going to be there? I'll be there. Really? Brad will be there. there. We're all local artists and we all love St. Charles. (laughs) So who is me? Me. I'm I'm Jennifer Stolzer. I'm a children's book author and illustrator. I have a praise. I reached my two-thirds milestone in my Threadcaster revisions, Yay. <laughs> and that puts me back on track for my release date in 2017. Yay! Keep an eye out for that. Congratulations. And Fedora, I owe you an apology. Uh-oh. Oh, for yeah? some reason, I thought your presentation to on poisons to the Missouri Romance Writers was November, not October. I missed it. This twice I've missed this presentation. On one it was a good presentation you did. Oh, I believe it. It's right up my alley. Mm-hmm. Well, one of these days I'll be invited somewhere else, and you can come then. Okay. Can I invite you to my house? <laughs> <laughs> talk about poisons. Talk to poison about somebody. 
Uh, it's it's so all. Can I get poisons. a private workshop on your poison? <laughs> I would never poison someone while Fedora could potentially be charged well, as an thank accomplice. You for that. Yeah, thank you. That. I care. That said, she I has the cauldron ready. I was going to say. Lessons. That, that sounded more like she wants to know now, so that in a future date, yes. after she can prove you weren't a part of it, um, you are going to poison somebody. Yes, a character <laughs> who will die horribly. <laughs> I charge more than you could possibly afford here. <laughs> what a. I wouldn't poison anybody, but I would won't deny times in which we, I've had uh, solicitors at the door who have knocked and asked me if I found something or other to be my personal whatever, and I've invited them in for tea and let them sit right in front of the entire bookcase filled of books of poison and I'll, other uh, forms of murder. I'll give you the cliff <laughs> notes weird. though for your character that you're going to kill with poison. Most of them involve diarrheaing to death. Oh, yay! That sounds. So, it's not a beautiful way to write a death, but it is embarrassing. Yes, it doesn't sound terribly dignifying. But dignifying. Speaking, of, speaking of death, today we're going to talk yeah. about a couple of things. It's a good segue. It is a good segue, and also talking about inviting, because of because mm -hmm. it's part of that. And that is, we are going to talk about submitting your work, submit, 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 and also, too, we are going to celebrate or the birth, actually, isn't it, it was his birthday, not his death Yes, day. it's his birthday. birthday of the famous Irish author Bram Stoker. And what Dracula. did he write, David? I well, know. actually, he wrote quite a lot. Nine yes, novels, a total of 30 some odd short stories and more, but he's probably best known for Dracula. I yes. saw the blood of the old <laughs> Or, as I still remember from a horror TV show that was back on when I was somewhat young, um, like eight, and they had a guy dressed up as Dracula would go, Oh, blood is blue, new blood is red, but when I suck blood, I suck it from you, blah, blah, blah. So, oh my. yeah. That's it, not it, he needs to work on his rhyme. Yes, it was a very horrid. Wait, that blah, blah, blah line from Hotel Transylvania is an actual thing? It's an actual yeah. thing, but what before... <laughs> Have you not heard Bela Lugosi as Dracula? He not does it without blah, trying. Blah, blah, blah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk today about submitting your work and the fear that comes with it. How do you submit? Let's talk some more about Bram Stoker um, and Dracula, which, by the way, just for record, um, I will talk a little bit about his famous work, Dracula. While many people harken back, no, uh, every pun intended, if you get that, um, to his work for being the father of vampire stories. The vampire stories were around before him. And what's really weird, based on some information I read a long time ago, um, the concept of vampirism, the concept of undead vampires, hit every culture on this earth before there was contact or known contact between said cultures. Mm -hmm. Now, each culture describes them differently, but the actual concept of it still remains the same. So it's kind of interesting that that would carry over, whereas werewolves, that was not the case. It's or our glooms, which we think of as Frankenstein. Well, it, uh, it makes sense, though, if you think about every human body in every culture has bleeding diseases. Mm -hmm. Once you wake up one morning and don't know where all their blood went, the answer is poison. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or some other way of it all pooling in places that it doesn't help you live. Right. And vampires in other cultures weren't always, you know, bloodsuckers. It was, uh, in part, potentially a way of dealing with wasting diseases. Mm -hmm. Like someone would get sick and they needed some explanation because they didn't have modern medicine to say, oh, it was this bacteria or it was this, you know, virus. Mm -hmm. So, you know, someone would die and then people in their family would start getting sick. It, something from they're, beyond they're was coming back. They're being plagued by some sort of demon or the, 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 the monster the person that died is coming back home and yeah. feeding on the family mm -hmm. and along with that is also an explanation for SIDS sudden infant death syndrome from that a lot, a lot of the vampires that are female in the various different um, legends about them they fed on infants and that was a definite that was the explanation for sudden infant death. It's also a way of describing the process of decomposition. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because when you go and you dig up a body, it doesn't always look like it just 
die. Sometimes, you know, the nails will look like they've grown because the skin retracts from the cuticle. Mm -hmm. and the hair does the same thing. You know, you'll, you'll can have a bloating of the stomach. Blood can form around the mouth. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, a lot of that was used to then say, oh, this person isn't fully dead, they're undead. Obviously, they've, they've been, been up to something. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. people in the village. In fact, as recently as a few years ago, there was a vampire killing in Eastern Europe where the family was being supposedly attacked by an undead creature, and they went to the graveyard and performed the ritual. Mm. Moreover, um, a type of vampire attack that I am familiar with, that other people may well be familiar with as well, is um, sleep paralysis. When you wake up and you're paralyzed, people used to think it was a vampire sitting on top of you, mm -hmm. like. Yes, there there are many different kinds of vampire attacks. They're not uh, like all over the world. It's the same kind of concept, the same kind of things that the kind of fears that people were dealing with. But they didn't always manifest the same way, depending Just, on the culture, and they weren't always killed the same way, depending on the culture. Despite what you see in the Halloween stores last mm -hmm. month, they don't all dress like Bela Lugosi. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> no. Okay. However, if you're a child of the 90s, mm -hmm. then you went through an entire era of people being vampires and sucking each other's blood. And then and being like, super sexy. Out, and then <laughs> being like, yes, this is my, you know... This is my blood partner, my uh -huh. lifestyle. And, you know, we go out. You know, it was a whole thing. And it it, it, it got so it much. It is a still a thing, but in the nineties, it was like everywhere. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's not a brand. Vampire was stab. <laughs> no. It wasn't Vampire was stab or the interview with Vampire first published in the nineties. I think yeah. it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it was published no, earlier. The movie was in the nineties. The movie, the book was the movie was the with the two of these stars. Okay. We're talking about the eighteen ninety seven Gothic horror novel by Irish author Brian Stoker. And there was also a vampire TV show that had him as a detective. Oh, yeah. Back then. <laughs> but, yeah Forever Dracula Night. Forever kind, Night. Of, kind huh? of popularized vampires for the mainstream because mm -hmm. before it was a lot of different stories and Dracula kind of created a funnel through which things started filtering. Yes. And, and, uh, I was going to say, okay, go ahead. I was just going to say that Dracula, the original novel, was very much steampunk. Kind of, actually, yeah, he, yeah. He'd yeah. been alive for a long time, he was bored, he made a bunch of stuff, he lived in a giant castle full of tons of books. Well, partly it's, it's it was written in 1897, so it's coming out, like, literally right at the, yeah. the end of the Victorian age, so... Yeah, there, there was a lot of, you know... It, it's a steampunk novel simply because it came out during the era of what we now call steampunk. And so. it has a train in it. It mm -hmm. does. <laughs> Not just yes. that, but it has recorded recordings, uh -huh. and maybe the type... A typewriting machine. I remember the typewriting machine. Mm -hmm. He used a lot of uh, technology of the day, so that is The why. difference is most of the technology actually existed. Yeah. 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 He it wasn't, wasn't making anything steampunk up. In, the, in the... However, quick shout out to White Wolf, anyone who did that. I know some of you guys just totally went, Because they had the best werewolf stuff in the day, or uh, vampire stuff in the day. Can you just yeah. please tell our audience what White Wolf is? Okay. It is, for anyone who doesn't know, which I'm sure a lot of you are like, what? No. Um, so it's D and D for uh, it's a role playing game for vampires called uh, it was Kindred. It was the TV show that yes. came out of it that was awesome. Masquerade. Vampire yeah. Masquerade. Yeah, Vampire Masquerade, Masquerade was the gaming. Kindred I know was the, the show. I know the the name of the game. Yeah, yeah. I didn't play though. It was awesome, and it pretty much led to the crazy vampire. Or it played off the crazy vampire like it was a craze. Fire fueled. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was kind of a back and forth. Well, speaking of coming back from the dead, how we always have to when we submit stuff and hopefully don't this receive a rejection. Like your transition game is on point for that. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> yeah. uh, Dracula itself was his fifth novel that was published, which was in 1897. So, submitting. Back then, there was a, back then, a lot submitting your work was so a lot different than it is today, um, and speaking, staying with the vampires and the horrors, the horror idea, I still love what Stephen King wrote about in On Writing, but he, even though he used a railroad stake, he would take all his rejection letters and literally stake them to the wall. So... Back in the day when you got physical letters. Yeah, yes. so back in the day when you get physical letters, nowadays you have to print the email or whatever. So. Okay, I'm a brand. Let's pretend I'm a brand new writer. I've 
never have submitted anything before or I've got stuff published, stuff written, but I don't know where to publish. How, how do I go about this? Well, should we start traditionally, like how they brand it? I love that it? you asked that question. Because uh, in Bram's day, you would literally print out your entire manuscript and you would hand it over to the publisher. And pretty and like they were like, you know, there were only like a few yeah. of the big guys who were doing that kind of thing. Um, and then you would have like conversations and if it was good quality and everything like that, they would pick you up and then they would print you pretty much for the rest of your days. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and there was a lot. Nowadays, it is a much different beast. Um, we have the query letter that goes to the agent, the publisher, or, uh, you know, and when I say publisher, you can have a small press, but it's never the large press that you need. Well, the, the big That's, difference is the query letter. Yes. And and I do want to break it down further, actually. For short story markets, there's not as often a query letter right. necessary. No, so short stories are a much different piece Short than stories novel. versus novels is a different process. A short story is going to be, well, a short story is going to be mostly to a, a journal or a, a publication of some kind. Right. You know, since Kathleen has just been uh, accepted at two publications, she's... <laughs> Then uh, she's the most uh, most current source we have on how mm -hmm. to successfully do that. So well, do you want to talk novels or stories? Or you know, let's, let's, let's start. Let's start off with short stories. The shorts. It's short. Let's start. Well, yeah, no, since Bram did both, so we can talk about that. But and Bram did both, but not that long ago, short stories were your way of breaking in to the industry. Yes. Um, in fact, that's how Bram did. Yeah, and the invention of the internet and its expansion and all that has kind of changed that to some degree. The blessing and the curse that is the internet. Well, it's not so much the curse of the internet, it's there was a change in the industry with mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, but has done this. So but so let's I'm gonna play old school here. Let's talk about short stories first. Let's say you want to do a short story. I I just wrote a short story. Now I'm gonna ask a question which I know all of us in here have been asked before multiple times, and I'm going to play the cabbage head, the person who's pretending he doesn't know anything, and I'm going to ask this question, and people out there, if you're new to the industry, please don't feel insulted that I'm asking this question, because it's probably on your mind. I'm Just asking ask it because it. it's on your mind. Yeah, it's set up. And that is, Stopped. can I put my short story up on my blog and then submit it somewhere? So it's loud, louder, please. I, I can read your lips, but nobody else can. Sorry, I'm shaking my head, and I said, no. And I, I say this with sadness because I'm the kind of person that likes posting things online for friends to, like, give feedback about. Mm -hmm. But um, when you post something online publicly um, for anyone to read and then try to submit it, uh, you're basically submitting it as a reprint because you've already published it on the internet. I think first North American serial rights if you're yeah. Yeah. in the States. First publication rights for shorthand. Mm -hmm. So um, you don't want to put a finish, like, I'm assuming that if you're ready to submit your work, it means you've revised it thoroughly. Um, in that case, then you keep the revision private and you start looking through markets. Um, you need to know what kind of story your story is, how long it is, and um, then you look for markets that fit what your story is, like that publish a type of story you write, that publish the word counts of the story that you write. And you want to then, if you can, look through stories or pieces that have been published in that publication and see if yours might be a good fit. So, if things again have changed to some degree over time, how do I find a market? I mean, do I go on there? How do I, and especially, and this will be more towards novel markets. How do I avoid being taken advantage of? So taken how do I get advantage of in what way? Okay, I was going to say that more for novels, but vanity presses. Your number one. No, number first off, don't go with anything you see on TV. Don't pay anyone any money up front. They're supposed to take their money in royalties after it's published. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you need uh, to find more information, go to predators and editors. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know the exact web link, but it's Preded. Preded. Preded.com. No, I, I would like to point out that <coughs> if you're self-publishing, people do pay for editors and pay for people oh, yeah, yeah. to help give yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. You can always pay on a 
here's the thing. If you're going to hire someone to do a job, that is a wonderful way of doing things. If you're going to pay someone a flat fee who's going to then take care of everything for you and do everything and give you a finished product, that is a giant red flag. Right. And uh, I want to put a little bit into um, publishing online. Uh, the internet itself is not uh, it's not totally off limits. You can use the internet, but do it in a private space, a private group, a locked forum, mm -hmm. something that isn't considered publicly available. That's how you preserve your publication rights. Yes. Well, there is Wattpad. And Wattpad, for those who don't know, is a online story posting place, for uh -huh. lack of a better term. Um, but the point of Wattpad is you're not posting the whole thing. Yeah. You're posting a snippet of your work, and then people are going, ooh, I want to read more, or God, this sucks. Yeah, I just wanted to make that clear for people yeah, who don't have writing friends who live near them, or know anyone who would be interested in their story to give it a, a decent critique. If the only critique partners you have are online, then you, yeah, please use the resources that you have, but do it through email, or do it through a secure website like that, or be mindful of how you do it. Don't just print the whole thing on your blog and ask people for a critique. <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. Yeah, don't do no, that. That's bad. And e this, uh, you know, archive of our own and fanfiction.net are not secure locations. No, no. they're not. We they love not. them, but they are not. No. Yes. And by the way, don't try to publish your own fanfiction with another company. You don't own the rights. You don't own the rights, and if you want to see what can really go wrong with fan fiction, pay attention to the lawsuit of CBS and Paramount versus Axonar Incorporated, or Axonar Productions. Check out Anne Rice. Yes. Yeah, or even check out Anne Rice, yeah. Um, um, but let's go back for a second. Yeah. Ed. We talked about predators and editors. I still want to get to the market. So predators, predators and editors are going to tell me what? I know the answer, but. Plug also for writers beware. Which is yes. done by Victoria Strauss, mm -hmm. uh, who is a goddess of this industry for everything she does. Um, but yeah, so basically, to answer your question, what does Predators and Editors do? Uh, Predators and Editors, along with several other sites like Writers Beware, um, I know RWA has a spot, SS, or SFWA, the Science Fiction Writers of America, has another one. Um, and what they are is lists of bad, bad publishers. Well, publishers who have problems publishers. paying, yeah. Mm -hmm. Publishers have, well, yeah, they do, but yeah. they will also flag some of the ones that aren't good. Mm -hmm. So you have publishers that don't pay their authors, um, people who've stolen rights, um, people who are considered predatory in the fact that they are trying to steal more of your rights than they're trying to give you. Because uh, the reality is, is that as an author, you should maintain most of the rights of your book beyond North American publication. Um, because that's technically all that the publisher needs in order to publish a book. No, they also they need they electronic can. rights, mm -hmm. they might want audio rights, but here's the thing, if they have those rights, you need to make certain they're using them. Mm -hmm. right? um, and Predators and Editors will break down, Predators and Editors really only flags the bad guys. Right. Um, and it's a whole vetting process, so I can't just say, this publisher's bad, and they make the list. But if I say this publisher's bad, and Kathleen says the publisher's bad, and Jen says this publisher's bad, Bam. Now, next thing you know, they're on Predators and Editors. It's really hard to get off. Predators and Editors is a cross-referencing website. Yes. And if you go to preded, is it .org or .com? I can't remember. I think um, it's .org. 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 If you go Do to a Google search for yeah, it. Yeah, Preded will bring it up. Um, but Predators is spelled like editor. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and Preded is easier to remember. <coughs> yes, it is. But uh, it, if you load up the website, it looks like it was made in the mid-90s. Yes. And don't be, t don't be taken off guard. It looks like a fake website, but it's a real website. Uh, search your, it's up, to, it's up to date. It's constantly kept up to date. Search the place that you're investigating and make sure it's not on their list. Right. Certainly, submitting for publication is a great thing, but I don't think that you have to do it necessarily for that reason. You can, for example, find lots of places to get your name out there and get a start through contests. You need to check that they're legitimate, That's but uh, most of the uh, authors' organizations will have some kind of contest, perhaps dozens of them, and that will help to get your word out and might get you the notice of somebody who would then publish it. 
And also, I don't think that you have to publish it per se at all if you don't want to. There is nothing wrong with simply sharing it. If you write a memoir that is about your family, maybe you only want to share it with your family. Yeah. And it's cheap enough. What does it cost? 20 bucks to make a single copy of the book that you can yeah, get pass around? Lulu. I was going to say, it can be yeah. less than Lulu, You get it for six and a half. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. a bargain. Yeah. 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 And you can make it for various people in your family. Give it to them. And there would be a lot of satisfaction in that. So when we say submit, yes, we mean publication. But that's not the only thing that's possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Before I turn this over to Kathleen, you're going to be next. But you, you, you talked about contest and, um, and what you were talking about. Sometimes you get noticed. I just want to throw out an anecdotal um, story. Actually, I've, I've seen this, witnessed this a couple of times. I've gone to Pacific Northwest Writers Association Conference multiple times, which I can be out there every year, but they have multiple contests. And there, they usually have had, oh, around 20 some odd agents and so forth that are um, being able to be pitched to and they attend the dinners. And they announce the PNWA, for short, announces the winners of the contest, as well as some of the other runners up and so forth. And it has happened more times than once, more times than five times I've seen the seen agents are going, Oh, I want to see the author of that one after this after dinner's done. I want to see the author. Can I get the information on that contact information for that author? So guys, they can get you noticed. I would add that uh, that's how. I got my first book published, which was Jack the Ripper in St. Louis. I won the May Haven contest, and they published it. I can't believe you didn't mention St. Louis Writers Guild's well, <laughs> short story contest that opened up November 1 and closes. I mean, or, uh, it opened October up October 1, 1 and closes, closes December, December 1. 1. And so and there's still time, although with the broadcast of this episode, no, this there might not be a lot of time. This episode will air November the 6th. Oh, so, so yeah, yeah, yeah tons plenty of time. of time. Keep going. There uh, you go. Living in the past is it's hard. It's been going since 1920. Speaking of contests, that brings oh, me back to the whole short story submission process. Yes, please. Contests and uh, places and uh, publishers or magazines, um, and also when you're looking into agents and publishers, all of them will have something called submission guidelines. You want to read those. You want to follow them. Yes. To the letter. Yes. You want to make sure that there is no reason but the work itself to be rejected because editors get a lot of different things, get a lot of stories, and honestly, I think depending on the volume that they're getting, they may be looking for reasons to put something aside because they don't have time to be reading everything. And if someone's not following the guidelines, who's to say that their story even fits the, the magazine that they've just submitted to? So don't let not following submission guidelines disqualify you from even being looked at. Also, failure to follow up mm -hmm. can be yes. a big problem. Talk about that a little bit. How would you follow up on a submission to a contest? Mm -hmm. Well, if, for example, you talk to an agent and they ask you for uh, something or other, the first 10 pages and uh, a, a synopsis. Uh, this is a novel. Okay. And uh, what you should do when you get back home is send it. I have all too often heard them complain that they invite people to submit stuff and they don't do it. They're scared. I don't know what the it's reason is. To me when I was an acquisitions yeah. editor. Did it happen often? Would you a say? Fair amount. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a large number of people that you'll talk to and you'll say, I want to see that and you'll never see it. For various reasons. Either people don't finish it or they get, you know, who knows? I, I don't really have an answer as to why people don't. I've never done it, so I don't know. <laughs> I've always submitted. Um, and you do have, like, generally some leeway there, too. Most agents will tell you you have a good month or so when they'll still remember you. Mm -hmm. uh, some even prefer if you take a little bit of time just to make sure that you looked over one more yeah. time. Right. I mean, some people, you know, say fired off right there at the conference, and that's something you can do. But more than likely, they're not going to read it right then anyway. So yeah. take a moment, get it right. And I always say submit when it's right. Always, uh, also a good thing to put in before we get away from submitting at con uh, conferences. Uh -huh. uh, do not, you can bring like a first chapter to yes. hand to them, but don't bring your whole book to hand to them. Uh, because, yeah, especially if they're flying. The yeah, yeah. Here's either. the beauty part, this is what I always tell people at my workshops when I talk about this. Set it down in front of you, between the two of you when you talk about it, so they can look at it, and know that you're going to take that with you when you leave. 
Right. Because they can't take everything. They got a suitcase. They, yeah. You know, they especially can't fill it up if they're submissions. flying, books are very heavy. Exactly. Very so, much. especially when they're in manuscript format. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't. Yeah. I mean, don't even offer it. No, no, no. They're going to want it electronically anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they if don't you want can it. have like because what they're going to do is they're going to pick it up. They're going to read the first line, maybe the second line if they like the first line, maybe the third line even if they like the first two lines, and then they're going to set it back down and keep talking. They just want proof that you know how to write in, com- exactly. in, in competent English. Right. Which I want to get back to your short story briefly before mm-hmm. we go. I do want to hit novels. That's a I'm jumping to novels, so feel free to guess well, we'll keep going. Yeah, whatever yeah, so we're talking about to, applies to novels it does. Much. It does, but one thing that doesn't apply, and this is why it's been so much out there, I want to make sure, since we started with the short stories, agents today don't represent short stories no. unless you're already agented and there's a special situation which the agents are dealing with. Well, so it's not that they represent it. It's just that it's, not, it's, it's part of the whole deal. So you might get in right. an, your agent might help you get in an anthology or exactly. something like that, going, but they're not going to particularly deal in short stories because there's no money in them. Yeah. Right. Um, you know. And sadly, there's a lot less, at least the high, high level uh, magazines that are publishing. And I will also there say this about forms. contested short stories. After you've won the contest and you've had your glory period where you're like, hey, I won that contest, maybe a year, maybe two later. Because um, if you can get a, if you win a contest, you can get it published somewhere, do that. But also, definitely consider publishing that yourself. So my award-winning short story, A Clockwork Heart, is now readable uh-huh. as an e-book. Yeah. I love saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm about to actually start publishing a bunch more short stories. Some I'll submit to contests and do all that kind of fun stuff. Others I'm just going to submit because they're serialized and, you know, eventually it'll be half a book or something like that, so fun stuff. But there, there is a market out there for short stories. It's just not the agented, you're never going to make the New York Times bestsellers list with a short story. Yeah. But you could win some really cool awards. Yes. Uh, but to jump to, to novels. So before we do, okay. I, I still want to go the question. So 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 the question is not trying. answered completely yet. We've talked about Prodad. We've talked about some other ways to see who's a bad publisher. I would also How do I get it to market? I would also throw out uh, QueryTracker.net. Thank you so much. Um, yep. So QueryTracker will also tell you good good publishers and stuff like that. Um, AAR will tell you good agents. Query Tracker will tell you good agents and stuff like that. So. Um, you can also get um, Writer's writers Market, either the book, which is usually yeah, out of date, but it publishes. Hey, guys, that's just the nature of the beast. But there's also an online version that yeah, keeps yeah. that up to date too. Yeah. The only, it does cost them. That one does. Query Tracker doesn't unless you do something. There, right. There's a free version and a paid version of Query Tracker. That's what I thought. Um, but yeah, so basically all of these are ways of doing research. You should definitely do research. Right. Um, do research on the publishers that you want to do. You know, and. For everything that you're going to do, know that there are still issues out there, but you want to give yourself the best shot. Um, you know, we've, we've all known people from small publishers who've seen, seen that small publisher full for different reasons. Right. Um, you know, Jollyfish just went down. However, Jollyfish just got bought up by another company, so now it's going to come back, and all right. those authors don't have to worry. Um, so, they're, you know, but jumping to novels, so I can jump to novels. Now we get found yeah, yeah, yeah. novels. All right. Um, finish the novel first, so that's the most important thing. You can never submit something that is undone or not finished. Not because you have a reputation and they yeah, want whatever you write. Exactly. If your name's not James Patterson, Stephen <laughs> King, uh, Neil Gaiman, etc., yeah. and writes, Neil can write a page and be like, "I think I'm going to write this next," and like a dozen publishers will fight for it. Right? We're not to that level, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'll totally throw myself into that category. Um, so write the novel, get it finished, get it perfect, because you want it literally published ready. You don't want any other work to need to be done to your book in order to have it go on a shelf. And then you're going to submit it. Now where are you going to submit it? You have a couple of different options. There's the top level, if you want to call it that, which is going to try and find an agent. Why do you want an agent? Because an agent's going to get you to publishers who do not accept unsolicited manuscripts. So they don't accept, I can't submit to Tor. Right. I can't submit to Simon um, & Schuster. Simon and Schuster um, some of the big... Random you know, Penguin. Yeah. Penguin. Classic. Yeah. Classic. Classic, yeah. I can't submit to these guys. However, if you have an agent, 
they already know the editors at these places. That's their job. Right. You know, they, they can talk to these editors on a regular basis. They know what the editors are looking for. So they they're, these they're a gateway of go-between you and the publishing industry. They're also your pit bull. So they will fight for your rights. They will fight for your money. They will fight for your book to make it perfect. Agents are a wonderful thing. Uh, that's not the only thing you have to do, though. There is small presses and mid-level presses that you can submit to. And if you submit to them, you know, Fedora and I both come out of, like, smaller houses. Uh, and those are wonderful places. There are some really dedicated people there. They don't publish hundreds of books a year. They publish, you know, maybe 20 books a year. Um, and you'll be one of those 20 books, and it'll be awesome. So then there is self-publishing or independent publishing. Take your pick and the... And that's where you're going to do all the work. You're going to hire the editors, the cover artists like Jen sitting over there, and you're going to put it all together. You're going to have your own marketing campaign. You're going to lay, get somebody to lay it out for you. You'll submit it to Ingram and all that kind of stuff. If you want to do Create Space, do it through Amazon. That's mm -hmm. another way. Um, but you're going to hire all these people. So to start at the top, uh, and I only call it the top because it's like, if you want to make J.K. Rowling money, you kind of need an agent. Yeah. Or you need to be a really super successful in one of the others. Or it helps if you own your own bookstore. There you go. <laughs> um, but you're going to write a query letter. So that's where pretty much all of this is going to start. Um, if you want to submit to a house, if you want to submit to an agent, whatever. You're going to write a query letter. And a query letter is a single page. It's single spaced. It's three or four paragraphs. Um, there is an intro where you say what your book is. There is a, I chose your company slash your agency slash whatever um, for this reason. You kind of want to give them a reason why, because you're trying to impart that you knew what you were doing and you're submitting to them for a reason. It might just be that they publish the same kinds of things that you're fucking writing. Um, you're going to let them know the word count. You're going to let them know the genre, all that information as fast as you can, because that's what they care about. They're getting... If some of the agents will get uh, 30,000 queries a year, um, so you can only imagine how many that is a day. Uh, so yeah, when I was an acquisitions editor, um, I would get a couple hundred a month, basically. Hmm. Um, and you just you go through them, you weed through them, you you know, and you just you know, for me it was two days a week where I dedicated myself to going through queries. Um, and then you're going to have the middle paragraph, which is where you talk about the book. And that's where you're going to have that back jacket copy is the best way I can describe it. Look at the back of a book, how that's describing the book, that's what you want to write. You want to talk about kind of the major character, the major plot themes, all that kind of stuff. And then the third paragraph is about you. And you can have a fourth one in there if you really want, where you're talking about the book twice or some different parts of the book. Don't get overzealous, though. Yeah. That's it. It's one page. Leave it at that. And that is, it's a business letter, so mm -hmm. write it as a business letter. Don't write it in the character's voice. No. Uh, don't get cutesy with it. It's very professional. And uh, think about what they want to know about you in that paragraph yes. about you. They want to know that you're serious, yes. that you actually can write, so the entire letter ought to be perfect. Yep. And they want to know that you have a platform which is likely to sell books, yes. that you are geared towards selling books is a key thing that any of the publishing house is going to want. Because truthfully, they don't care whether you write horror or romance or whatever it is, as long as it sells. And you have to show them you can sell. I will say this too, if you don't have writing credentials, you haven't won all these awards, you haven't gone to these cool schools and got these degrees, that is completely okay. Tell them why you're passionate about your genre, what you're writing, it's going to impart. Now don't say, you know, I've loved horror my entire life, or something like that. You know, describe a little bit more, you know, about why and about what you've done or anything like that. But that can be a short paragraph, it doesn't have to be a massively huge thing. Yeah, um, I wanted to just reiterate and further emphasize the whole professionalism aspect. You're writing a business letter 
to someone, address it to the agent or to uh, who you're supposed to be addressing it to, the yeah. agency. Uh, not, you know, not first names unless they want you to. Look and see what their requirements are. Uh, make sure you title it the way that their submission page wants you to title it because sometimes they're using algorithms to sort them. Yep. If you title it wrong, it'll end up in the trash. Uh, more of that, follow the instructions like Kathleen said, because the first step is to prove that you know how to work with people's requirements. Mm -hmm. If you don't follow instructions, they're going to wonder if you're going to miss a deadline or yep. if you listen or if you're hard to work with. I wanted to say about the paragraph about your book, uh, Back Jacket is great to compare it to. Don't write it in your character voice. Don't write it like it's a page out of your book. And don't put the ending in it. Yeah. If they want the ending, you put it in your synopsis. When you write a synopsis, you put everything in there, including how it ends. And uh, that's how they'll find out. Don't you the, the paragraph about what happens in your book, it's, who is your book about? Where does the adventure take place? Why do they care? And who's trying to stop? Them? You know, yeah. it's, that's, it's the conflict and then the intrigue that's going to make them say, ooh, I want to learn more about that. If you say it's about Little Red Riding Hood, she meets a dangerous wolf, he eats her, she gets out. They'll be like, oh, that was nice. I guess I don't need to, to accept that story anymore. I already know how it ends. And then they'll pass on you because they have five bajillion queries. And I hate to phrase it this way, but sometimes they're looking for a reason. To, to oh, pass. As a former acquisitions editor, you are looking yeah, for Yeah, absolutely. It's like there's so I'm many... I'm looking for anything to say no to this so that I can move on to something else. It's like right. it's a harsh thing to say because we know. Your yes. friends here at the Right Pack know that your work is brilliant deserves yes. to be published for certain. But unfortunately, we don't publish books. So we can't take everyone's book. And the, the agents are the same way. They're looking for something that they, quote unquote, have fallen in love with because they're dedicating years of their lives to helping with this and it's not it, it it's something very special that makes them take a gamble mm -hmm. i would also say never tell them why they're going to love this book. yes that's a horrible thing you can do don't throw them any cheap pickup lines they've heard them all already exactly. they've heard them all and you're not a total pass. no and uh and you know i've loved horror my entire life is just filler it's like it's like a a styrofoam popcorn peanut filling a box it's like there's it's just it, there's nothing of substance in a yeah. line like that and other lines like that if it sounds formulaic if you're putting it in there and it's cliche then that's just something they're gonna hop over and they're not gonna read it anyhow i would also say that diamonds always do stick out mm -hmm. like the really good stuff that comes into a house like that does shine through the rest mm -hmm. you see the good writing you see the good character this true story sounds intriguing the title was like a little, oh, well, that's kind of cool. Uh -huh. You know, so it's it's just something in acquisitions. Yeah. The diamonds do stick out. Right. And in Winding Trails, being the producer, that's all I've got the acquisition editor. I'll tell you, I, I, I go to links within my, on the website, to tell people how to submit a story. Mm -hmm. I give examples of how your story should be formatted. Because writing radio dramas is different than all the other ones that's closest to um, writing for plays or writing for screen screenplays, but it still gets differences, and I cringe. People, when I receive a query, when I receive queries about it, and I receive the scripts, and it's not in the proper format, I cringe. Now, since it's a new since it's a new company, I do go ahead and I do review at this time. And, but at that point in time, you've already got to strike one. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm being honest. So as soon as strike two occurs, I'm pretty much kicking you out of the box. It's a two strike policy. It's a two strike policy. Mm -hmm. well, I used to do the same thing. Yeah. I, had, I, I had three. Mm -hmm. uh, because I would always sort every, I sorted all the uh, queries that came in. The ones I really liked, I knew I was going to push on to the team that was beyond me. Uh, the ones that I would take a look at again, and the ones that were just you know, I was going to send a quick rejection letter to. Uh -huh. um, but I will say that it was never just one thing that made me say no. Right. There was always multiple things that would end uh, up making This is me about a vampire. It's out. Never mind. <laughs> hey, vampires are back. <laughs> just can't be sparkly, and they got to be, you know, horroristic kind of vampires. Uh -huh. But they're back. So we knew it would only be story, 
they're looking for you. Hear that, dystopian writers? It all comes back around. It all goes circle around. Um, okay. Well, I think that uh, it is time to talk about the appeal of Dracula. Okay. We can jump back to Dracula. <laughs> so, since yes. we just talked about vampires. Right. Yes. We yes, just did. already did. Yeah. The sacrifice already there. There you go. So, well, um, so do the unveiling of a cloak. <laughs> well, I think that vampires have mm-hmm. a long-running history. At some points in history, much more prevalent than others. And if there's time, I'll talk about some of the historical connections to blood sucking, which goes way beyond just vampirism. Mm-hmm. But I think that Dracula has eternal appeal in a lot of ways because it is so darn sexy. Yep. Yeah. Let's face it, for example, we have most of the scenes in the bedroom. Yep. They mm-hmm. are sometimes homo- homoerotic, too. Yep. They're not just <laughs> men and women. Well, I want you to continue. Okay. So remember the time period, folks, when this came out. The idea of the Victorian age, people didn't think about sex it was not a. Oh, they thought about it. They thought about it. I don't know. I thought about the public view. People were not supposed to think about sex. Women wanting sex. Oh, that, there must be something. Women didn't have wrong. a sex drive. Yeah, they, if they had sex drive, there's was something a thing me- as a mentally or medically wrong with them. Isn't that where Live Back and Think of England came around that time? Oh, say yeah. again. Live Back and Think of England. Yes. Yes. Doing your civic duty. Mm-hmm. And um, also, too, just on a sidebar. If you don't know what flower language is, I don't mean being flowery with your language, but flower so, language comes about during this time period. Go ahead. Well, for one thing, <laughs> uh, for as a matter of health in the Victorian era, the general belief was that women should have sex no more than once a month, ever, and men should have it at least once a week. So, the, you know, the numbers don't really work out there for, for, actual, <laughs> for actual monogamy. But back to Dracula. Why is Dracula sexy? Because it's about penetration, for yeah. one thing. Mm-hmm. It is about exchange of bodily fluids. It is oh. about <laughs> it is about some of the uh, key fetishes in sex. That is dominance. Can you imagine modern businessmen who have? decisions to make all the time. They get to fire people and so on and they feel guilty about it. So they would prefer to go to a dominatrix who tells them what to do and punishes them because they need it. Well, you get that (laughs) from Dracula and you also get the victim who wants to be dominated. You get the dominator. You get perhaps Bram Stoker's own original inspiration. His show was written just after Oscar Wilde, who was a notorious homosexual and was imprisoned for gross indecency, Mm -hmm. just after he went to jail. That's when it came out. Do you think there is no connection? They were friends and Irishmen together. Hmm. I was going to say, you're totally right. I mean, not only that, but it breaks Victorian convention and the fact that this was a way of being able to talk about sex without actually talking about sex. Um, you were mentioning it happens in the bedroom and all that kind of stuff. It was a pleasurable event. Yes, there were some victims who got torn apart, but other victims like uh, uh, her friend, I can't think of uh, no, There's Lucy that. and Mina. Lucy, Lucy, yes. Lucy was her, I was looking. Lucy enjoyed it. Lucy loved it. She had, like, you know, it was a pleasurable experience. She kept the window happened. open on purpose. Yeah, mm-hmm. so, you know, it was well, a way of showing that. Yeah, know. exactly. You couldn't resist. There was a draw. All that kind of fun stuff. Um, and what he did really was he took some of the sexier sides of vampires that hadn't been brought up, he was pulling it away from some of the folk myth and putting it into uh, what we would almost call today a romance novel. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I love uh, that side of Dracula and I think it is one of the reasons why it has become you know, such a perennial. And then. When does it become big again? In the 50s with Bela Lugosi and all that kind of stuff. That's well, not the 50s, well, that's no, like the 30s. 30s that's right. And the 20s and the 30s. But it would no, continue, I should say, in the like, 30s to the 50s, because that's when the monster movies ended. Their no, I, I think it's more like there are various periods of it, and they correspond, in my uh, estimation, to colonialism and neo-colonialism. 
which was what was happening, of course, in Bram Stoker's own time. Yes. It was a time of great upheaval. Then we go to the 30s, where we have the Great Depression, mm -hmm. and there you get the Bela Lugosi movies, yes. which are the scarier ones in my estimation. Mm -hmm. Then there is a big resurgent in the 60s. That's where all the Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee movies are. Those are my favorites. Mm -hmm. the They're not scary at all. They're, They're just tons scary. of Technicolor blood, and they're yes. a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And once again, in the 60s, it was a time of great upheaval, a time of the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. Then we come to the 90s, where we get uh, Anne Rice's book, which was published 30 years earlier, that comes out, and we have beautiful vampires with curly hair, and they're just adorable. And then we get the weekly ones, which are even more adorable. Well, you got Gary Oldman's wonderful portrayal of Dracula. <laughs> I yeah. do love his glasses in that movie. <laughs> yes, that was very steamy. And it's once hair. again, that's all a beautiful hair, and he turned into a gorilla, which is news. <laughs> <laughs> As the background is all of the troubles in the Middle East, the Afghanistan War, the Iraqi War. It's a time of unsettlement, and also a time of, let's face it, sort of neo-colonialism, when you get right down to it. Now, fun part, take? sorry, just to kind of take it to Graham as a, an author. How dare you take it back to our title. I know. <laughs> Uh, but Bram did something fun in that Bram had did not actually travel to Transylvania yeah, right. to write. He actually stayed back in Europe and wrote the entire thing from there. Hold on, hold on, hold on, sorry. Transylvania is still part of Europe. Okay, good point. And the other side of Europe. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Eastern. My yeah. Romanian friends, thank you. Well, yes. the Carpathian Mountains are somewhat east, yes. Yes. They're somewhat. But he did not actually travel to the destinations for which he wrote it. Was unusual for that time. I don't know. Shakespeare didn't go <laughs> to Verona either. No, but I mean, it, you know, in the Victorian age, a lot of the books come out of what you were, you're, that writing what you know period, so you were to have known about it. That's why Melville's, you know, spent so much time on the docks. I don't know. There's a know. huge, there's a huge uh, number of eerie kinds of stories being written at that time. Le Fanu was writing. And there were a lot of uh, magazines. The Strand magazine was bringing out a lot of mm -hmm. eerie kinds Marty of things. The around then too. <laughs> <laughs> so that there were, uh, you know, uh, Wilkie Collins, the woman in white. There were a lot of ghost stories. Yeah, but you also had like Jekyll and Hyde, which was direct knowledge. You had uh, Dumas writing what Dumas knew. He's practically writing about but his father. But those are horror stories too. Yeah. Well, and okay, since so you're bringing up the time period. And some of the spookiness was also remember this occurs trying to do math in my head real fast so nine years after Jack the Ripper? 1888? 1888. 1897 is when Dracula was published. Mm -hmm. So we just had so there's a there there is going back to transition time, talking about your social upheaval, you're also starting to see this come about. And nations everywhere were were colonizing here, there, and yon, including the United States. Mm -hmm. We colonized uh, the Philippines and the Sandwich Islands, which have become Hawaii and various places in the Caribbean. It was a big thing for countries to do. If they could, they did. Mm -hmm. And that is, of course, blood sucking of a different kind. I was going to say that kind of domination relationship that you just that you just talked about. Yes. It definitely is. Sucking the life out of whatever society you're looking at for your own benefit. And on that happy note of laying them down in the coffin and staking them and chopping their heads off. Yes, I'm drawing from Dracula. I don't remember that's just the movies or that was in the book. I've read both and I've read the book and... I'm no, you have Van Helsing. I mean, that, that's what yeah. Van Helsing was supposed to be doing. Right. Van Helsing, Vampire Hunter. So with the Van Helsing and the vampire hunting part. Let's talk about the ugly side of submission. I was wondering when we were getting back to submission. So I like that segue too. Just keep them going. <laughs> keep going. So what do we do when we get rejected? Cry. I was thinking, yeah, do we, do we Do we close the coffin in on ourselves? No, and we wait close for the, the sun, door sun on ourselves. Again? We Only take for the door and hours. stick our head in the jam. No. Uh, ice cream important. and movies? It's important to let yourself be sad yes. Yes. because your emotions are real and rejection hurts because you put so much work in. The important thing to do is to stop being sad 
or at least not let the sadness destroy you. Because the uh, that feeling of rejection, while it's always going to be there a little bit, you'll get more used to it the more you submit. And you're going to get a lot of rejections because it, that's just the way it goes. You have to learn, and it's one of those things you have to learn on your feet. So, so, uh, so be sad. It's okay to be upset, to be angry about being rejected. Don't take it out on your agent that you... Mm-hmm. Don't fire back a reply. Yes, don't please. even say thank you for your email. They don't care. They're done with you now. Oh, uh, <laughs> on, the, on that particular topic, Julia Cameron recommends writing uh, for yourself to never leave your site ever or your house or your email, you know, writing like a letter in reply, just kind of getting all your feelings out about the rejection. But you never send that ever it is just a private kind of journaling thing for you to do to kind of get over what happened um and something i realized on the subject of rejections that we have not brought up yet is uh when you're submitting your work and you have a list of places you want to submit to always submit in the order of like top down yeah. your your first choice and then your second choice and then your third choice etc don't you submit save to- your mm-hmm. top choice for later. Yeah, yeah. because like the if worst thing that can happen is right. that you submit to your first choice and they say no. The other worst thing that can happen is you submit to your last choice, they say yes, and then you find out the first choice totally would have taken that and paid you more for it mm-hmm. if you had submitted to them. The only thing I don't like about you, the um, message you talked about, right? The, the writing the letter even though it never leaves your possession is I would likely hit send by accident. Don't write it in your email. This is like a to- this is a journaling type Maybe thing. Handwrite it. So Hand it's not even it. electronic. Yes. Put it in a like, word document. It's it's but, more um, it's more so like a journal diary. If you've entry seen the for uh, preview, I'm really jumping the shark here. I'm gonna move over to Brad and try to jump the shark. If you've seen the preview for the new movie, I think it's called On the Edge of On the Edge of Seventeen or whatever it is, with Woody Harrelson and this teenage girl is writing a text messaging a guy who she really likes and we're texting something sexy, let's put it that way, and she doesn't mean to hit send, and she sends it anyway. That would be me. Go ahead, Brad or Catherine. Keep in mind, if you are the kind of person to impulsively send a letter that you are writing for yourself yes. to someone else, people remember letters like that yes, in, they do. in the business. And the writing community, as far as publishers goes, is not that big. No. So if you anger an editor because they were doing their job. Yes. They're going to remember you. Sure. They're going to tell other people about you. Remember, writing in the submission category is a business. You do not make your business look bad by throwing temper tantrums at people who are just trying to do their jobs. And they're not just going to tell one person. They're going to tell the entire industry. Uh-huh. They're going to go on Twitter, mm-hmm. maybe, and talk about how horrible you were. They're going to bring like, up conferences exactly. where people and ask, you about, ask them about yeah. anecdotes of crazy mm-hmm. people. There is um, one of my clearing instructors, Victor Laval, who's amazing, led with a talk to all of us when he came in to teach for the week. He said, don't be an asshole. Mm -hmm. People remember those people. People talk about those people. Don't be one of those people. If you need to write something for yourself, do that. Don't send it. Yeah, you remember the good and the bad. I still remember the good and the Mm -hmm. bad. What I was going to say, though, this is very important to know about rejection. Mm -hmm. Um, rejection is never about you, the author. Yes. Um, it is never about you, the author. I have never rejected anyone because they were, asshole. you know. No, well, I mean, usually their work is bad, too. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> but even agree. then, I'll work with an asshole. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You know, if they wrote an impeccable book and it's awesome and I know that I'm going to make a ton of money off their book, I'll work with an asshole. Uh-huh. Um, but the, it's rejection is always about the work. I'm never rejecting an author. I've never been rejected as an author. I have always been rejected because my work was not good enough. My work was not what somebody was looking for. Um, I just got assaulted by a cat, and that's awesome. <laughs> um, that usually doesn't happen in the query process, but no. sometimes. People but it'd be still awesome love if cats it did. when they're cats. Query cats, that's what People, we need. not so much. Uh, but yeah, no, seriously though, it is never about you. Um, it is always about um, the work. The work may not be up to par. The work may just not be what they're looking for. Um, every agent, every editor, every house knows what they're going to publish that year. Um, they they have an idea of what the market is selling. They have an idea of what's really popular on bookstore bookstores right now. 
They know what readers are looking for <laughs> next. And if you don't fit into that this year, bummer. That sucks. Put it in a drawer, save it to next year. Maybe the trend will come back your way. Um, but it's never about you. It's always about the work. Yes, they reject your book. They, yes. They don't reject your author. Uh, Kathleen, keep going. Okay. Sorry. Uh, well, I was going to bring up something that is special and marvelous and uh, is also a rejection. Personalized rejections are wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful things. Um, they should be taken as an encouragement to send more work to that publisher, to that editor. Um, personalized rejections are basically, you have form rejections which aren't personalized at all. They're just, no. we have not accepted your story and there's no real touch of an individual on the other line. Right. It's just kind of rope. Personalized rejections are wonderful because that means the editor who has, you know, said no to your work cared enough about it and thought it was a good enough piece that they wanted to tell you a little bit about how you could make it better. It took time out of their busy day to write you a personal letter. And that kind of letter you can reply to. Mm -hmm. If you get a letter that says, oh, well, thank you for sending your work. It wasn't quite what I wanted, but I really considered it real hard. And here's some advice for maybe the next time you submit and you, you can write back and say, thank you very much for your thoughtful letter. But, you know, don't write them a riot act about why. And don't immediately turn around and resubmit with a, a bunch of corrections that you thought they were asking for. If they pass, they pass. There are some, I think, rejections. I've not had one of these where, like, they will potentially accept upon a rewrite, and they'll tell you about that, and they, they should make that clear. They'll, they'll but request, yeah. the request uh, to re yeah. revise and resubmit. Yeah. Revise and resubmit. So um, those are different. I, and I you have, should take time. Yeah. That should be at least a month two months, three months down the road when you resubmit. Um, I have gotten a personal rejection before, um, and it was spot on. It was spot on. I knew yeah. there was something a little wrong with the story, but I couldn't tell what it was. And the, um, the, the writer who sent it, who was editor at that time um, for that particular magazine, I really loved her work. And she sent me this letter and I was like, oh, everything just clicked. That is what was wrong with the story. Mm -hmm. So they can be really helpful. Like if you're gonna get rejected, that's the best kind of rejection you can possibly get. So even though it may sting because you didn't get your story published with that particular venue, um, that's an editor reaching out and trying to help you get better because they believe in your work. And uh, we're gonna close with that for today, but I wanna say thank you for bringing that up. There are different kinds of rejections because most people think, or I think a lot of people think, that when they get rejected, they're rejected. End of story. And recently, I had submitted, or rather sent, a rejection, but if you rewrite, please resubmit. And I never heard from that person again. Mm. It was a really small, minor thing. For a play, it would have been perfect. For a video, it would have been perfect. But for radio drama, it didn't work. It was a really minor change. Never had heard. Oops, that was cat. Yeah. Never heard again from that person, and don't know, don't know. But I think they took it as a rejection, mm -hmm. and that was the end of the story. I would also throw out that if you do get accepted, that's just the start of another long road. Oh yeah, yeah but that's funny. a topic for another day. Yeah, we will conjure that up again from the grave. Yes, as we gravely close today's ah. session. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. I know you Happy guys late Halloween. Happy late Halloween. <laughs> Happy birthday to Bram Stoker. And everybody, have a great week writing. Tune in next week for yet another interesting tale in the writing industry. And never let your writing die away. Let it be undead. <laughs> let, let your writing be undead. It will rise again tomorrow night. I was exactly. going to say, getting your work accepted is kind of like having your writing rise from the dead because it was dead to you for a while, going out places, and suddenly you have to deal with it again. And it is sucking up your time and your energy, but then it is making you money. So <laughs> Being published is like being terrorized by a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> GatewayCon? What is GatewayCon? 
the Gateway to Publishing Conference and Convention, brought to you by St. Louis Writers Guild, is a new, unique experience for writers looking for their work to be either traditionally published, independently published, self-published, or to further their writing career. Coming in June 2017, GatewayCon will provide opportunities for writers to pitch their work to agents, hone their craft regardless if it is genre fiction or non-fiction, and obtain expert critiques. Get to meet vendors and experts who can help your writing get attention, and all writers get their work in front of their audience. Writers will get to network with agents, publishers, and others in your genre. Gateway to Publishing Conference and Convention will be in St. Louis June 16th through the 18th, 2017. For more information, visit www.stlwritersguild.org or look for GatewayCon on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr. GatewayCon, opening the gateway for writers to reach their readers. Did you know that Right Pack Radio has an international audience? How would you like to reach that audience in regards to your books, your book services, your author services, or more? Go to www.windingtrailsmedia.com and look under advertising for more information. If you don't have a script, that's not a problem. We will be happy to work with you. Once again, go to www.windingtrailsmedia.com for more information. The new theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her.